All right, hallelujah. You may be seated. What a wonderful time of worship in so many forms. We're so blessed that here at King of Kings, we get a chance to worship in the musical form. We get to worship in the prophetic form. We get to worship in the waiting on the Lord form, the reading of the word form, and the giving of the Lord's tithe and our offering. All of that's worship, by the way. And when you serve, you understand that's also a form of worship when you get a chance to serve. So we're so grateful you're here with us tonight. Welcome home, King of Kings family here in the house. Welcome everybody watching online, Kings Community Live, Facebook Live, YouTube, other platforms around the world. Welcome to King of Kings here in Jerusalem. And there's a long list of countries that are watching tonight. So thank you, media team, for getting me those, uh, the names of those countries. But I wanted to point out... Um, a couple of uh, folks that are watching tonight. We just want to bless our friends from South Africa who are watching tonight. We appreciate you, South Africa. Listen, we know there's a lot going on right now in South Africa that maybe we're not so happy about, uh, but we appreciate you guys and the ones that are praying for us, connecting with us, South Africa. Bless you today. Uh, also, there's some friends uh, watching tonight from Turkey are watching. We don't always get people from Turkey, but bless you, those from Turkey. Uh, we, we love you guys. We appreciate you jumping in here with us. And listen, speaking about a couple of family business topics before we dive into the Word, if you want to get ahead of me, by the way, go ahead and turn in your Bible or your devices to the book of Daniel. Okay, book of Daniel. That's where we're going to be tonight. But look, those of you that are members here at King of Kings, this coming Wednesday night, you saw on the screen, we have our membership vision meeting this Wednesday night, 6 p.m. So if you are already a member of King of Kings, come and join us. If you're trying to become a member of King of Kings, come and join us. All of our membership agreement forms will be available that night as well. If you're just checking us out, come and we'll answer some of your questions at the same time. But for those of you watching online, we got something special for you coming as well in 2024. Beginning in the month of February, if we can pull it off, we are going to start our live stream broadcast 15 minutes early, uh, earlier than the regular service begins. So we start at 5 here in Jerusalem, so at 4.45 Israel time, we're going to be starting a live broadcast only with the online audience from our recording studio, and you're going to get some private time with me and our other leaders, other pastors, other elders, deacons, and other leaders here at King of Kings family. We're going to get to do a little a Q&A, some, some teaching, some updates, and just some personal time. So that's fun, right? Some fun stuff for you guys online because you're so faithful to be with us uh, every week. I also wanted to say a special thank you and an honor and a welcome uh, to uh, Eda and uh, Chiara. Pastor Chiara is here tonight from Italy. Thank you for being here. We're so happy to have you, and, and she pastors in Italy, and her mom uh, is, is also the head of Christians for Israel, but the Italian branch of Christians for Israel who we are connected with. So thank you for being here tonight and your whole team. You know, we last couple of years, guys, we haven't had a lot of visitors here at King of Kings. I know that, uh, that normally in our past, we're well known for being so welcoming to visitors, but we just haven't had the chance the last couple of years since about... March 2020, I'm not blaming it on anything, I'm just saying about March 2020, we haven't had a lot of visitors since then, so welcome. We're glad our friends from Italy could join us tonight. Let's jump into the Word of God. Father, would you help us tonight just have an open heart, have open ears to hear everything that you're going to teach us, Father, corporately, but also everything you're going to teach us individually tonight. Holy Spirit, use the words that we read and say to pierce our heart. And we pray that as the disciples of yours, that we are ready to be transformed into your image tonight in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Listen, friends, last week we took some time to address some of the hardships in our life, right? That was a lot of fun. You, listen, you indulged me for a little while last week. You let me ramble through a bunch of hardships that we could be facing. And we didn't do that just to set up a platform for complaining. That wasn't the reason we did that. The reason we went through the hardships last week was so that we could identify with one another, that somehow we would connect with so many of you here in Jerusalem, maybe online, that are going through something similar, because we don't want you to feel alone. 
That was the point of taking that time. And as a recap, we mentioned that Yeshua promised us that we would have trouble in our life. It's not our favorite promise in the Bible, but it is a promise in the Bible. John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So there's the promise. So we just got to get ready for it. But we, we spent that time last week going through hardships, not to complain, but to identify with all of us, to let us know we're not alone because of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can endure it. That is a good word of encouragement. Number one, you're not alone. Number two, there's always a way out. God never puts you in a situation where you cannot win. Remember I said that last week. God, will, he's never putting you in a situation you can't win. Ooh, see, that's going to tie into Daniel really nicely. Almost like I knew what we were going to talk about tonight. Almost. But then we're not just left alone to feel like, okay, my friends and my community know what I'm going through. Yeshua knows what you're going through. If we remind ourselves of this passage in Hebrews 2.17, for this reason, he had to be made like them. Yeshua had to be made like us, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. You see, it's not just us. It's not just a way out. It's that your God, your Lord, your Savior, Yeshua, has also faced hardship, trial, trouble, and to a certain measure, temptation. He's seen all of that thrown at him as well. And last week, we began with our character study from the book of Daniel, which is what we're going to continue tonight, which is why you are already turned to the book of Daniel. And we noticed that when Daniel was faced with tragedy, when he had been taken hostage, when he was exiled from his country, and he was forced to engage in pagan acts that violated God's law, what did he do? Remember, we want to give you practical things to take away, not just theoretical thoughts. We want practical things to take away. So what did Daniel do? Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, that was the key verse from last week. But Daniel, excuse me, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Daniel resolved. Daniel decided. Daniel finished the conversation. And then the conversation was over. Never again to be revisited. Daniel decided righteousness in his heart. You have that ability as well. So when we finished last week, here are the conclusions from last week, just in case you missed it. Daniel, like Yeshua and like us, he faced some very severe challenges. His country was conquered. He was taken captive to a foreign land. And he was pressured to participate in pagan ways that violated God's law. But Daniel gives us some good tools that we can apply. First, he resolved in his heart what he was going to do. And this, he was active and he was not passive means he wasn't the victim. Second, he would not defile himself or compromise God's law at all. So he was active, he had decided, and he was uncompromising on God's law. And third, he stayed engaged in his purpose by using his gifts for God's glory. And in return, what happened? Well, God granted him supernatural favor and gave him knowledge and wisdom to interpret visions and dreams that ultimately gave him an audience with the king and greatly influenced the most powerful nation on the earth at that time. He was not passive and he was not a victim. Okay, so that was last week. Now let's just take that momentum. We're going to jump right in into what else did Daniel go through. And by the end of tonight, when we finished, what we're going to finish on is I'm going to give you 10 items of how Daniel could lose and yet still win, right? So that's the title of this message in the Gaining Strength series. It's losing but still winning 10 different ways, okay? 
That's what we're going to do. Losing but still winning in 10 steps. So we know that Daniel had gained favor with King Nebuchadnezzar. And this was by God's supernatural power. I'll read it to you from Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Now God had caused the officials to show favor and compassion to Daniel. Verse 20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned him, he found him 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. So again, this wasn't Daniel just impressing some of the lower downs. This was Daniel standing in front of King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king on the earth at the time, standing in front of him, answering questions. And every time a question was thrown at Daniel, the king was impressed. God gave him great favor because of his faithfulness to the Lord and his word. Now, this may make you think that Daniel escaped the hardships of life and now he was somehow skating on easy street. You say, oh, he's He's got favor with everybody. He's got a favor from the officials and favor from King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful empire on the earth. Well, now he's in good shape. Like, what can go wrong now? Daniel's in good shape. But then we're going to start to walk through the rest of Daniel's life. And I admit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come to you as a little bit of a quick survey. But in this quick survey of the book of Daniel, we're going to stop and grab some of the key points all along through the book. For instance, right here, King Nebuchadnezzar has these dreams, and no one can interpret these dreams, and then he decides he's going to make a rule that since the magicians and the interpreters and the wise men, and no one can interpret his dreams, he's very frustrated, he makes a rule. He decides, I'm going to kill all of them. Shows you a little bit about his character. Hey, man, I had this dream. Anybody tell me what it's about? No one? All right. I'm going to kill you. So not your greatest boss. Some of you, maybe we complain about our boss. King of Kings people, I know you don't do that. But maybe you have a bad boss. But my guess is your boss is not as bad as this boss who said, if you can't interpret this dream, I'm going to kill you. Listen to what it says in Daniel chapter 2, 12 and 13. When they could not interpret the dream, this made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put them, the wise men, to death. And men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. If you thought that Daniel had the favor of Nebuchadnezzar and now he was skating on easy street, you have it wrong. Because right after that, Daniel, there are men coming to Daniel saying, hey man, I think you're a nice guy. It's not me, okay? I've got to bring you some news. It's not me. But the king is going to kill you. And Daniel says, what's up? Yesterday I had great favor with the king, right? I was wise. Remember all that? No, not today. Today you're not wise. Today he's killing you. Well, what did I do? Well, you didn't interpret his dream. Well, he didn't tell me his dream. How am I supposed to interpret it? Well, that's just part of the game. Daniel didn't have it easy. The men literally came to his house ready to kill him because he could not interpret the king's dream. So what did Daniel do in the face of death or at least the threat of death? So let's bring this back to our practical solutions for what happens under trial and challenge and trouble. I'm still in Daniel chapter two. Look at 14 and 15. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and with tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? And Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. So here's a piece of that practical steps you can take. We should notice that Daniel speaks with wisdom and tact he does not allow his emotions and his fears to dominate his decisions and the way in which he speaks to other people. He did this in the face of death. Can you imagine those of us in the room, and I said us, that might struggle to keep hold of our emotions, to keep our emotions in an appropriate place, 
to not let our life be governed by our emotions or not let our emotions bleed over into all the scenarios of our life. Those of us that might struggle with these emotions have to look to Daniel because in the face of death, Daniel had composure. He spoke with wisdom and tact, and he gently and respectfully asked the official what was going on. I'm not sure I would have responded that way. You know, there's the fight or flight syndrome in a lot of us. Generally speaking, what kicks in in me is fight. I will fight you. Hey, Chad, uh, listen, we're here to put you to death. No, you're not. Let's fight. Others will run. I'm not a runner. I'm a fighter. And Daniel teaches us a lesson that you don't have to do either. He didn't run and he didn't fight. He used wisdom and tact and he kept his emotions in check even in such a tense time. That's a lesson for us. That's a practical lesson for us. Then, then what does he do? He then calls for prayer and intercession. And then he not just does it himself, he calls the other Jewish men to prayer and intercession as well. And then it was while they were praying that God reveals to Daniel the meaning of the dream, which he then shares with King Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel makes sure to give praise to God for the miracle of the interpretation, and he does not give glory to himself. I just gave you three practical things. In the face of death, he controlled his emotions and spoke with wisdom and tact. He immediately moved to prayer and called others to pray as well. And when God broke through with the miracle, he was quick to give God glory. This is not pie in the sky here. This is practical. This is what you could do in your life. Let's read this, Daniel chapter 2, verse 27. Daniel replied, No wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that passed through your mind as you were lying in the bed are these. And then he goes on to explain what they mean. Tonight, we're not going to focus on the dream. That's not what this is about. You can read that in your text. But I was pointing out to you that when he received the interpretation and he went before the king, he was quick to give God all of the glory. There is no man, including myself, who can do this. God in heaven did it, and he alone gets the glory. What a practical step to take away in our life. Now, what comes next in Daniel's life? Okay, Pastor Chad, I think I see what you're doing. Daniel, he lived in Israel. He had a good life. Babylon came in, took over. He was taken as a prisoner and a hostage to Babylonia. So he's in a bad place. So it was from good to bad. But then he met the king, and all of a sudden he has great favor, so it's good again. Oh, but then the king has a dream, and no one can interpret it. He's going to be killed. Oh, it's bad again. But then he gets a miracle, tells the king, so it's good again. So guess what comes next? Bad again. You say, Pastor Chad, I really love it when you go that direction. I don't like it when you go this direction. What's going on over here? And why would, why would I keep building this pattern for you? Because I want you to grab something, friends. Just because you're going to face a challenge and you get victory in that area doesn't mean you will never face another challenge. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you, you will face another challenge. There will be another trial. There will be another hardship coming your way. And one practical thing we can take away is this. Live your life in preparation for the next challenge because there is surely one coming. Those of us that have gained a good standing and have victory, the most dangerous thing you can do is sit on that as if it's all over. Friends, we don't, we don't sit on anything until we're in New Jerusalem. You know what I mean? Like, then you can sit. Then you could be done. But even then, you're going to be so hungry for the Lord's presence, you're going to pursue him for all eternity. But prepare yourself practically for the next challenge, as Daniel is going to show us. So after this encounter with Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel found himself in not just in a good place, like where he had favor. Now he finds himself in an even higher place 
than before. Before, he was taken out of the pool of slaves and exiles, and he was placed into the team of wise men. He was part of the team. But now he's not just part of the team. He's in charge of the team. Daniel chapter 2, 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel. Can you imagine? This is the most powerful king on the earth. And he's bowing down in front of Daniel. You talk about low to high. A few minutes ago, he was dead. And now the king's bowing in front of him. What a roller coaster. The king paid him honor and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all of its wise men. So he's even higher now than he was before. Think about that. The lower, the harder the challenge, it might just be that the victory is even higher. So when you start to get discouraged, friends, about just how hard it is, remember Daniel. Remember Joseph. Right? It wasn't just that his brothers hated him. That was pretty low. Then they threw him in a pit. That was even lower. But then he got pulled out of the pit and he got to go work for one of the masters, that was high. But then he got thrown in the dungeon, the lowest. And then he got pulled up to the second in all of Egypt, the highest. So the next time you're facing a very hard challenge in your life, something that's going on a long time, I want you to remember, even though that feels like the lowest, it might just mean that you're about to receive the highest victory in your life. So try not to be discouraged. And yet, even at this high point, another trial was surely yet to come. That's a lesson we need to take away. There's always another challenge coming. Cannot put your guard down. That's why even though we believe in the Sabbath principle of rest, the battle for the kingdom of God never takes a day off. Never takes a day off. Remember, I told, I told you guys that story before. I was in university and I was between classes every day, I would, I would go into like the a foyer and there were no chairs in the foyer. I, I've never said like a foyer without chairs. I didn't ever understand that. Thank you team for putting chairs in our foyer. It's part of my reactionary vision. But I would go to the foyer of this, uh, this building and I would, with no chairs, I would just take my Bible, sit down and read. And I did it every day. I had class like the morning class and then a break, so I would read the Bible and pray right there in the foyer, and then I'd get up and go to my next class. So I did it every day, every day, every day. So my friends would come in and out. They would see me. Hey, Chad, what's up? How you doing? And then finally, one time, this person came up to me and said, you do this every single day. I said, right. So said, why don't you like take a break every once in a while? Take a day off. And I said, well, you know, the kingdom of God never takes a day off. We take a Sabbath for our bodies, for our mind, for our spirit. But you never take the day off from the kingdom of God. You know who else doesn't take a day off? Satan doesn't take a day off. He does not believe in Sabbath. So be mindful of that. The kingdom doesn't take a day off, and that's why we must always be in a preparatory state for the next challenge that's on the way. We commit ourselves to daily devotion, to personal and family prayer and ministry, to community life engagement, to serving and accountability, all the things we regularly teach you here at King of Kings. So what is next for Daniel? Surely another trial is coming. I'm not even going to mention here that Nebuchadnezzar then goes on to make a golden statue, and then he tells everybody to bow down, and a lot of the Jewish people do not bow down. And then they're about to be thrown into the fiery furnace, right? That's a huge story in the book of Daniel, but it, Daniel's not even involved in that one unless Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were already in that wise men's circle. And guess who was put in charge of the wise man circle? Daniel. That means he might have been involved in that. Now, he may not have directly been at threat of his life because he was already past that test. But my guess is that he counseled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego on what to do. 
hey, stay faithful. Do not defile yourself. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Pray to the Lord fast. I'm going to pray and fast with you. God always breaks through. Just that good counsel that Daniel would, would give them. And God, of course, delivers Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They uh, also had their hearts resolved to honor God's word. They too were promoted by God's supernatural hand because of their faithfulness. And then something interesting happens. Daniel has done this back and forth, high, low, high, low, high, low, and now he's really high. And then, just when you think, oh, he's got it made, King Nebuchadnezzar is gone. He dies. And all the favor he had, he doesn't have anymore. It's like Joseph, right? You know, he had favor, and then he didn't have favor. Then we have one of his descendants, Belshazzar, becomes the king. And Belshazzar, just like Nebuchadnezzar, does some really weird, random things. So one day, he's at this lavish party, and during the party, there is the you know, miraculous handwriting on the wall, if you know that story. And once again, no one can interpret. They go to the wise men and no one, you know, again, no one's there. Daniel, who used to be in charge of the wise men under Nebuchadnezzar, apparently is not anymore. Somehow he got demoted with the new king. So there's a high, low, high, low, back to the low. And Belshazzar looks to the wise men. No one can interpret. So he doesn't know what to do. He's angry. He's half drunk. And the queen comes up. And the queen says, hey, I remember under Nebuchadnezzar, there was this guy. Remember Joseph and Pharaoh? Hey, Pharaoh, I remember there was the guy in the dungeon. He could do the dream thing. And this is the queen. I remember there was this guy. Is a Jewish guy a long time ago. I don't know. I don't know where he's at now. And I think he can do something about dreams, visions, and riddles. She's not even sure what, dreams, visions, riddles, I don't know, puzzles, I don't know, something. He does something. Rubik's Cube, I mean, he can really pretty much figure out anything. So Daniel's reputation goes before him. The queen advises the new king to go call for Daniel. Daniel comes in, and of course, the Lord does the same thing. He prays, the Lord gives the interpretation. And in this instance, Daniel was put in a very hard spot. And this is our next lesson. Daniel has to interpret the riddle and it's not good news. Remember, I don't want you to think Daniel had everything easy. It's not good news. As a matter of fact, listen to what he says to King Belshazzar. Daniel chapter 5, 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all the things your father did. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all of your ways. That's a nice word to bring a king. You know, hey, you didn't humble yourself and you did everything wrong and you didn't honor God and he knows it. And tonight you're going to pay the price for that. So what's the hard thing Daniel had to do? Daniel had to tell the truth no matter what. Even in the face of Daniel probably felt like, okay, here we go again. I mean, all the things I've gone through, I might as well just tell the truth. I mean, I've been threatened to die before. And he stands before the king and he says, all I can do is tell you the truth. You know, one of the things we're called to do in times of trouble is to continue to tell the truth. Not start lying to get the pressure off of ourselves. Daniel could have done, he could have tried to get the pressure off of himself. He could have tried right there to regain his status. Remember, he had been high and then low, high and then low. Now he's the highest ever. And then the king is gone. Now he's low again. They forget him. And here's his chance to get back in the game, get back in the palace. He could have said something nice to the king. Oh, king, the riddle means you're the king of kings and no one is like you. And 
you will be blessed and have the greatest kingdom of all time. And the last piece of the riddle says, as long as you keep me in the palace by your side, we're going to do fine. Are you sure that's what it says? Yeah, the last piece right there. It says, give Daniel a special apartment. But he doesn't, he doesn't twist it his way. He only speaks the truth, even in the face of death. And what's interesting is that Daniel gets immediately promoted again. This guy, like you don't want to see his resume. His resume would confuse you. Exiled from my homeland. I'm a prisoner. I'm sorry, the next year I was one of the wise men. And then I was kicked out. But then I was in charge of all the wise men. And then I was kicked out. And then I was third in the kingdom. And then I was kicked out again. And then I was second in the kingdom. I just keep going. Every, like every time I go a little high, I'm about to be king. And then I'm going to be in the dungeon. Like his resume looks crazy. You might be thinking this guy, what does he do to get fired? Maybe he's bipolar and he's like, can't figure out who he is. Is he a good employee? He's a bad employee. I don't know. But he's immediately promoted again. And then... And then he gets promoted, and the very night he's promoted, there's an invasion. And the king that just promoted him gets killed. And he's right back to the bottom. This guy keeps losing. But every time he loses, he kind of wins. It's a strange thing in Daniel's life. So then we have another king enters the picture. What happens to the third king? Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Now Daniel was so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He'd been a wise man. He'd been third. He'd been second. And now he's about to be number one by the third king. And every time he loses, he keeps winning. Just think about that. Every time you face a harder trial and a harder trial, God might just be elevating you one more step. He might be taking you one more step. Because why? That's not something I'm making up. That's the pattern in the Bible. Don't let the enemy discourage you on these things. But in the process of all of this favor that's coming back his way, he's unfortunately creates some enemies. Look at Daniel 6, verse 4. Remember the highs and the lows. Now he's high again. And at this, that means his promotion, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. The king was then tricked into making a law that would appeal to his pride that no one was allowed to pray to anyone else for 30 days. They did it to set up Daniel because they knew Daniel was faithful to pray three times a day. This was done on purpose. His reputation went before him. So again, highs and lows. What did Daniel do? Daniel 6 verse 10. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. In the face of death, for like the 10th time, he's going to keep on praying. He's going to keep on being disciplined. He's going to keep on with his walk with the Lord. It's almost like Daniel doesn't care about what's going on around him. It's him and God, and he's going to keep going. And then and when y'all need me to interpret something, I'll come, but I'm right back on track. And then when you need me to do a riddle, I'll be there, but I'm going to be right back on track. And when you need a miracle, I'll, I'll come to your rescue, but I'm going to get right back on track. And I don't care if you change the laws. I don't care if you change the kings. I don't care if you change the kingdom in charge. I'm going to keep praying three times a day. And it was this devotion and discipline that Daniel had that God honored throughout his whole life. This is another hardship. It's another high and another low. And of course, you, you know what happens during this story. 
He goes from in charge of the whole kingdom. Where does he go? To the lion's den. Now he's the lowest he's ever been. And yet he stays faithful to the Lord. Let me give you the key phrase of tonight. Staying faithful to God's word puts us in a position for God to do something supernatural through us. Those of you that want supernatural, you better stay faithful to God's word first. You want the miracles, you better be in prayer first. You want God to choose to use you in a special way, you must devote yourself to God first. Staying faithful to God's word puts us in a position for God to do something supernatural through us. Now, of course, here, by the time we get to this story, we're talking about the lion's den, and Daniel gets delivered from the lion's den. But in this ending to the story, it was God that produced the justice, and he enacted revenge on Daniel's behalf. Daniel did not seek revenge, and I, that's a piece I want to give you tonight as one of our ten. I'm about to summarize all of them for you. Daniel didn't seek revenge. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 23. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had been trusted in, into God's hand. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and they were thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and their children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all of their bones. Daniel didn't come out of the lion's den counter-suing. He didn't come out pointing fingers and accusing and being like, hey, retribution, I'm getting you back. Revenge. He came out and he stayed focused. Study of the word of God. Dedicated to God's word. Pray three times a day. Be a servant. Choose wisdom. Keep your emotions intact. And stay focused and let God worry about those other things. Remember, this is not the end of Daniel's life. I only made it to chapter six. And there's a lot more to his story. This is not the end of Daniel's hardships. Those of you that know the history of this story, you know that yet another king gets conquered and another empire takes over. And later, we learn about Darius, we learn about Cyrus. And I did a little research here. And according to the Institute of Creation and Research, Daniel may have served under seven different kings and three different empires. Let me read you a quote. Daniel served as a high official in Babylon under several kings, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar from Daniel chapter 2, followed by Evel uh, Merodach, Nergal Sherazar, Labashai Marduk, none of whom are mentioned in the book of Daniel, but in other writings. Then under Nabonidus and Belshazzar, who was the son of Nabonidus and co-regent with him in Babylon, at the same time of the fall of Babylon to Persia, according to Daniel 5. He then continued under Darius the Mede and finally under Cyrus of Persia, according to Daniel chapter 6. All of this seems to have occupied a total of 70 years. Daniel's road was not easy. Daniel's life was hard. He was probably exhausted by the end of all of this. The highs and the lows. Exile, hostage, wise man. Prison, in charge of the wise men. Back out of the palace, third in command. Back out of the palace, second in command. Back out of the palace, over all the kingdom, into the lion's den. Back out. And that was not even all the kings. There was other kings still coming. Every time he gets promoted, a king loses, and he loses all of his progress. And God is right there saying, don't worry about it. You stay focused on me. I'll keep bringing you up. So what are the takeaways? I promised you 10 takeaways, and we're going to run through them quickly before we close. I want these to be very practical for our application. How can someone lose this many times and still win? 
Here are the 10 steps Daniel took. First thing, just because you face one trial and come out victorious does not mean you will never face another trial or challenge or hardship. The hardships will keep coming because life is hard. So live in preparation for the next challenge. Number two, Daniel had resolved in his heart what he was already going to do. He was active, not passive. He was proactive. He was not a victim. Number three, Daniel would not defile himself or compromise from God's law. He didn't matter what the punishment was. He was not going to compromise because he had already resolved. Number four, Daniel stayed in control of his emotions during a life-threatening situation. He chose to use wisdom and tact. I skipped one. Let me go back to four and five. Daniel stayed engaged with his purpose by using his gifts for God's glory. That was actually number four. Remember, he kept using the gifts of the dreams and the interpretations and the riddles. So he used his giftings. He stayed engaged with his giftings. He served other people, and he stayed in control of his emotions. Go to number six. Daniel was quick to move into prayer and to call others to do the same when he was faced with trial. Quick. His instinct was to pray. It wasn't his last resort. It was his first instinct. Number seven, Daniel was quick to always give God glory for the miracles done through him. He never stole God's glory. It was always given to God. Number eight, Daniel spoke the truth, even when it was hard to do, and even when he knew that there may be a negative consequence. Well, he did it with respect and gentleness, but he still always spoke the truth. Number nine, Daniel was faithful to keep his spiritual disciplines in place by continuing to pray three times a day, even when the laws of the land prohibited him from doing so. He kept in his discipline path. And finally, Daniel allowed God to take care of his enemies. He focused on obedience and kingdom building, and God handled those who were against him. He didn't get distracted with revenge or retaliation. Let me close you with Matthew chapter 6, 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be given to you as well. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the story of Daniel. We thank you, Lord, that we can see so many situations that we can relate with from a harsh boss to getting promoted, to losing a position, to losing favor and honor, to being picked up again, to being lied about, a scheme against us, to being tempted to break God's law, to defile ourselves, the ability to stay disciplined. So many lessons here. We thank you for the goodness of your word. Let us take it, apply it to our life, we need your help, Holy Spirit. How do we apply it to our life? Where does it fit? We don't want just a faith that lives in the clouds. We want a faith that turns into action today. How can we live this way? We want to gain strength tonight from this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Listen, we're going to go back into a worship song. There's not going to be any upfront prayer tonight because we have deeper connection in the lobby for those of you that need prayer. So that's where you can go to get your prayer ministry tonight. But interesting thing about Daniel, there's a lot of great patriarchs in the Bible. But in most cases, the patriarchs and the matriarchs have these great stories. But usually there's at least one problem in the story. You know, Abraham was doing great until the whole idea with Hagar, right? Adam was doing great until the tree, right? You have Isaac was doing great until he lied just like his father lied. And Moses was doing great until he hit the rock. You know, like this, there's always like the, the piece of the story that's not great. David was doing great until Bathsheba and Uriah, you know, not Daniel. Nothing is ever said about Daniel in the Bible that wasn't on point with a man who was disciplined, and chose wisdom throughout his whole life. 
Let's use Daniel as that example that we can study. Bless you. Let's stand up. Let's worship.